Okay, uh, so now it's um, time to start. So this is the lecture number eight. Uh, we'll talk about cardiovascular cases. Uh, today we have a guest lecture by Peter Luba at the Department of Clinical Sciences Lund Pediatric Heart Center, Skåne University Hospital, Lund University, Sweden. And the same uh, conflicts of interests as usual. Um, so, uh, the outline of today will be uh, first uh, cardiovascular cases by Peter Luba uh, and then the questions and answers. Um, so, this was the, the plan at least. Um, however, I think we will actually start with uh, live segmentation. Uh, it seems like uh, Peter is uh, still stuck in clinic and is uh, trying to, to get here. Uh, so, uh, I will actually skip directly into that directly now. So, okay, uh, so, um, uh, yes, we can start with uh, this case. Um, uh, we can actually start completely from 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 scratch. By okay, so now we are completely <clears throat> from scratch. So um, the vision for this model, as uh, we can see here uh, in the sagittal view, uh, there's lots of uh, calcium in this um, vessel. This is this patient is actually a, a, originally a MAPCA, so major artery rear pulmonary uh, collateral, um, and this is a gra uh, is a graft uh, that been severely calcified. Um, so one of the aims is to, to, to get the model to visualize this. Um, and here we can also. Uh, see so it's a small stent. So uh, this patient is also uh, a nominal uh, uh, arterial um, or uh, uh, coronary arteries. So we will try to ensure to, to get uh, those included in the segmentation as well. Uh, so this, this image is already uh, cropped, otherwise I would first crop it. Uh, double check it's isotropic, so it's already isotropic. So here, I will just adjust uh, our mapping. So try to uh, see if this is a good mapping. Mm -hmm. Seems uh, reasonable in all uh, three major views. So. Then, uh, for cardiac purposes, I often use this bond tool. So I just click on the segmentation. Uh, and get uh, a quite good uh, starting point for the segmentation. Uh, and um, uh, we can actually see it in, in, in 3D. So something like this. So it's a good, uh, good starting point. And um, uh, one thing that is uh, important in, in uh, uh, for cardiac uh, cases is that, um, and what you often want to do is we want to make the the model hollow. Um, and for that, it's it's problematic if they are um, if the two if two surfaces uh, touch each other. We have also had some problems with with uh, contrast filling. So we can start with the contrast filling to complete uh, this case, and then I typically use uh, this touch-up tool and then adjust 
the threshold a bit higher. I could not use that uh, and just the size of the light tool. So something like this. We can also uh, fill it. Hmm. So it performs now local threshold inside this uh, region, that's in the sphere. Here is an example where um, the two surfaces touch. So if I make this hollow, this will be actually create a hole here between. So I need to separate these surfaces. I have this icon here. Uh, and I apply this in 3D, so it's not per slice I need to do this. There, we can switch to transversal view to ensure that we got uh, the coronary arteries right here. Yes, there's the coronary arteries. Uh, however, we, we missed this coronary artery. So switch to this touch up tool then. Follow that along a bit. So like that. Okay, and now we can view <coughs> the model in 3D again. So we could uh, now I want to get, uh, highlight the calcium in the um, uh, in this model. Uh, so we, then we create a, a, a new part with just the threshold. So typically uh, only get uh, calcium, and I can use this tool. And then it's hard to see, so I have contour around it. Something like this. Uh, okay. And then um, like this, so we can view it model in 3D again. So now we can see the, the calcified part in 3D. You can see the blood pool here. Here, I would like to cut away uh, the top. So I can just cut in this plane. Uh, so, um, and then we can make it uh, slightly smoother. And then make sure it's only one part. Uh, 
and we can make it uh, a hollow model. Like this. So now uh, we can, <clears throat> we may want to uh, try to cut the model here in a suitable plane. And here you can see the, the, the coronary arteries that was important. So we could actually try to cut this model here along a And this plane. Like this, and we can want to keep both parts. And watch it like this. So here we can see. Uh, uh, the, the model like this, then we can take the uh, calcium that was here. And, and add that uh, so we can here Yes, we can see the, the calcium is added here. And then uh, if we want to, we can print it in, in different colors. Uh, like this. Um, yes, um, I will actually show you <clears throat> how, if we want to add the, the left ventricular myocardium uh, for this case. And then I will, uh, Peter uh, arrived a few minutes ago. So I will let him um, uh, give some details on, on the case. So uh, what I now want to do is add to this model a thick myocardium. And then we use a tool uh, here. Uh, so we, are, we, we try to find the mitral valve and then put some points. The points were already marked here. So they were okay. Put points here. We can add slices every one millimeters. So now we resample the image stack to a new direction. So this is now short axis stack. So then we're cutting the ventricle up. So it's more, will be more like a round uh, surfaces um, that are easier to, uh, to segment and to understand the orientation. So here we can scroll and now I'm scrolling more to the base. Oh, sorry, uh, to, towards the apex. So this is the, the ventricle, left ventricle here. And I want to get the rough outline of the left ventricle. So, and then I actually, I just draw it manually and then you can take every few uh, slices. And this is for, I mainly use this for orientation, so it's uh, in the model. So it's not the crucial part of the model. You can actually see here that the septum is uh, unusually straight, so it indicates probably right ventricle overloading to some degree.
And here we get to the upload track, so we just make it very, very thin here. And then we can uh, interpolate, so we uh, get lines in, in between the draw. Now we're ready to go back. Uh, to 3D print mode. Uh, <coughs> and actually take away uh, part of uh, this is actually my uh, no. get away remove some of these cuts and all that so here we generate Can call this hollow part. Okay. Uh, now we import an object from another uh, image stack. So we take the myocardium or uh, the epicardium from the other image stack. So it's very rough because we have to do it in some slices. What we'll do in, is that we uh, make it very uh, smooth. So maximum smoothing. Can delete this object. Uh, now we take uh, this part. This is actually what we can call our blood pool. We need to subtract uh, these two objects. What we'll get is the actually the myocardium. So we call this myocardium. And we can add that to the hollow, so we get a, a model with a thickness. And this is usually uh, really important for, for the visualization. So we take a shorter system, a larger part like this. And here, uh, another alternative of cutting this model could, could maybe be uh, trying to cut it like this. So this really depends on what's the question with the model uh, and, and what parts uh, should be easy to see. So even now it wasn't that great cut. Both the, the left ventricle and the right ventricle and the, and the vessels and get a quite good model that is easy to print. We might remove some of these long ones, but it's uh, quite easy. I think I already showed you during the course how to cut uh, vessels like this. So I can just uh, continue cutting vessels until they finger too long. So with that, I will uh, hand over to uh, Pietro to discuss these cases. Hello everybody. Um, some of you might have met me before. My name is Petro Liuba. Einar has already introduced me. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. So I, um, typically in my clinic um, meet patients with congenital heart disease and um, also have expertise in congenital cardiac transcatheter interventions. So I do cases in the cast lab trying to fix different problems um, using the catheter, which is a plastic tube of various dimensions. I just want to uh, uh, give you two quick examples um, of two very complex patients. 
with congenital heart disease uh, just to illustrate from my perspective, from my point of view, the utility of having a 3D print. Now you see two images on the left and on the right. Um, is this what they see, Aina? Yeah. You see a red model and a whitish model. Um, they actually illustrate the same case, isn't it? Yeah. The same case is an older patient with a so-called pulmonary atresia, uh, ventricular septal defect, and MAPCAS. MAPCAS, they are multiple autopulmonary collaterals uh, supplying the lungs, and they do remain, they do develop very early during the fetal life. They are embryonic vessels, and they tend to resolve to disappear um, later when the native pulmonary vessels uh, develop gradually. So these MAPCAS, uh, they don't uh, practically exist in a normal heart or normal circulation. Now whenever you have a problem with a pulmonary uh, valve, it doesn't exist, um, you might have a large defect in the ventricular septum just as a way for the blood getting into the right ventricle to run off uh, into the systemic circulation. And in this case, um, the lungs have to be supplied via a different source of blood supply. In this particular case, by a so-called MAPCA, so collateral is coming from the aorta, embryonic vessels, uh, which are more and more dilated in time. Um, typically or very often assuring a certain degree of um, blood supply which is coincident with survival at least when the child is born, um, but very often uh, needing a series of surgeries aiming to uh, gradually uh, reconstruct the lung circulations by number one, connecting a conduit uh, between the right ventricles and the pulmonary artery bifurcation and number two by reconstructing the pulmonary artery bifurcation and uh, in some cases if the lung circulation is dependent on this MAPCAS by including this MAPCA vessels in the final lung circulation. So eventually in some patients there are only MAPCAS which will be used as pulmonary branches. Now these MAPCAS, they are not healthy vessels. They tend to develop a number of um, complications, mainly consisting of stenosis, narrowings, which must be tackled surgically or using the catheter. And also uh, associated uh, in the long run with a higher risk of um, pulmonary hypertension due to problems um, occurring both centrally due to stenosis and more peripherally due to um, due to abnormal small vessels. Um, now this is an older patient who had this surgical repair, very complex, only MAPCAS at birth had a number of operations of surgeries and um, developed uh, quite early after a surgical repair, uh, several significant narrowings both in the left and right pulmonary branches. Remember again, these are not normal pulmonary branches, they are previous MAPCAS, so very bad vessels. Um, you see on the left image, you see uh, something whitish. No, oh, sorry, I didn't know. Can you see my mouse? Oops. Can you see? Okay, that's uh, this whitish color means a lot of calcium, which tends to build up in the inner uh, layer of the vessel. This is not uh, the patient's vessel; is a conduit. It's being implanted by surgeons. There are different kind of conduits: uh, human conduits, uh, bovine conduits, and so on. This is a human conduit, which tends to build up a lot of calcium inside, especially is a conduit is in the patient for a long while. So all this whitish color is calcium. 
Now, um, one of the problems with calcium, it makes the vessel very rigid and um, also when it builds inside the vessel, it may develop stenosis. It may also affect in time the conduit valve leading to regurg and of course uh, leading to a need later on to replace this conduit valve. So these patients typically uh, need uh, reoperations. Uh, what we don't see here, um, this model is cut in a different way just to show the conduit and uh, from my point of view, just to um, give me an idea again um, if um, there is any chance to implant a valve using the trans catheter technique. Nowadays we have this possibility to um, use a trans catheter technique to implant pulmonary valves even in very calcified conduits. But you have to make sure first of all that you have a way in uh, of course and we have in this case secondly that you have this um, or you have a conduit which is far enough from, from the coronary vessels. Um, otherwise if you implant a stand which is going to have inside the valve, you may obstruct the coronary vessels and the patient may develop a severe complication. So that's a very important issue we need to take into account whenever we discuss about percutaneous valve implantation in uh, conduits, regardless of how calcified they are. Um, in this particular case, um, I don't think this image shows properly, but you have here you have actually one of the one of the coronary vessels, it's a right uh, coronary artery which um, lies right behind the conduit. So this is the aorta here, that's the descending aorta, part of the aortic arch descending aorta, right ventricle, the left ventricle, and you see the conduit, the proximal part of the conduit, and here we have a narrowing uh, where the previous valve uh, um, was initially placed, and you see all this calcium uh, causing uh, stenosis just at the uh, level of the valve. Once again, if you implant here, um, uh, percutaneously, if you implant a valve, you might get into trouble. So uh, that's uh, another very nice way to illustrate the possible limitations of the trans catheter technique based on this image. Of course, we use quite a lot of CT, but in some instances, it's quite good to have, um, to hold this uh, model in your hand and to see if it's possible to go higher up maybe with the valve and avoid the proximity to the coronary vessel. Higher up means that you go a little bit more distally. And this is why I wanted to have this model, just to take a look inside and to see if there is any chance to use a different kind of valve and to avoid a reoperation, which uh, might uh, be extremely troublesome for surgeons, since this patient had already five or six reoperations, so it's a very, very hard tissue inside when the surgeons go in to replace the conduit. So always an advantage whenever is possible, no coronary issues, and nothing else posing an issue for percutaneous implantation, always preferable to go percutaneously. Of course, there are some other uh, criteria that uh, have to be met. So uh, once again, this model shows very clearly the calcium, the distribution of the calcium, the whitish, uh, and also how much space is left uh, in a 3D uh, perspective, how much space is left for an eventual uh, a valve stand here more distally in the conduit. Um, now, uh, one of the issues this patient, one of the main, uh, uh, one of the limitations this patient has, um, this patient had already um, an eight, nine, ten earlier castorizations with five stands already already implanted. Um, the central uh, pulmonary artery, which has been reconstructed by surgeons, it um, doesn't look like the normal one. You don't have sufficient space. So even if you go more distally with a stand enclosing the valve, you have to make sure um, you don't compress the other stands which have been already implanted in all these MAPCAS. So um, that's uh, another important 
uh, utility of this 3D model, especially if you see these stands, you don't see at least in this cut quite properly, but I saw them in a different, in a different cut and uh, could realize uh, quite rapidly that any further uh, way to implant another kind of valve percutaneously is not going to work out in this patient. So this is the first case um, illustrating the utility of 3D printing in these very complex patients. Um, I really, um, it gave me a lot of help, a lot of support, and not only to me, but to the entire cast team. Do you want to add something or should I just, no? Anna? no? Okay. Now, this is another very complex patient, much younger, um, also a female patient with the same kind of uh, congenital heart defect and pulmonary atresia, a defect in the ventricular septum, and a number of MAPCAS that have been eventually included in the final pulmonary circulation. And um, a, a conduit, you see part of the conduit don't look yet as a bluish material. I'm going to let you know about what they stand for. A conduit, you see part of the conduit connecting the pulmonary artery bifurcation and the right ventricle. Now this patient developed very early after, after this conduit repair, developed a severe narrowing of the left pulmonary artery, uh, was less than one millimeter. We had a long discussion at the surgical meeting and um, given the short time, um, after the surgery and given the number of additional surgeries the patient had, we all decided that the best way is to open up this vessel using um, a percutaneous way by implanting a stent. And you see this stent very, very clearly placed in a nice way in the LPA. So um, that was one of the procedures we did um, we did last year and um, eventually we were happy with the result. We managed to recanalize the LPA and um, as we always do, of course, um, we wanted to do a recast, to do a CT first and do a recast and go in and dilate further the stand in order to uh, increase the diameter of the left pulmonary artery. So once again, this is a proximal left pulmonary artery and what you see here is part of the bifurcation inside the left lung. The left lung is right here. Okay. Now, the CT which was done uh, in a different city where the patient was followed uh, showed the problem with uh, another narrowing. We are not quite aware of what this narrowing means in terms of pressure, always measures the pressure to uh, have a proper estimate of the narrowing severity. Uh, we did a CT or they did a CT and we had a long discussion at a later surgical meeting and we eventually decided as we originally planned to go in again and, and balloon dilate the stand and try to fix this if uh, there will be any issue here. Now, here comes the most difficult part. Uh, whenever you do this procedure, planning is essential. Uh, we do a lot of cardiac ultrasound, which is quite good, but cardiac ultrasound is not going to be sufficiently sensitive to uh, show the problem, uh, especially in the lung vessels. A CT or MRI, uh, they are quite good. MRI is completely useless if you have implanted material because you'll just see, uh, or you won't be able to see anything. It's just a black spot since the metal is not visible of MRI. Um, that's the best case scenario if the metal is MRI compatible, uh, which it is in this case. So we do a lot of CT, but very typically, even if you do a CT reconstruction, you won't be able to understand several problems, which may cause you a lot of difficulties during transcatheter. So in this particular case, um, we decided to go based on CT to take the patient into the cath lab and to try to dilate the stent and to eventually place another stent. The decision to place another stent was actually made in the cath lab once we realized we had a problem 
here between the conduit and the left pulmonary artery, which was stented. Um, what was extremely difficult in this case for us was to get from the conduit into the left pulmonary artery with a sufficiently large tube um, in order to place a second stent once we confirmed the problem. Uh, we had a very long procedure and uh, was a bit difficult to figure out based on CT why we had so um, so difficult to to get into this left pulmonary artery with a larger tube which will accommodate the second stand. So this this 3D print was actually made by Einar and um, his colleagues after the gasterization. You see a second stand has been implanted but is displaced, doesn't sit in the proper position. Ideally you'd like to have the second stand located inside the first stand in order to proper dilate this part of the proximal original stand. So this stand was, 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 was um, placed in a less optimal position, uh, was eventually operated uh, by surgeons uh, a few days ago and they replaced uh, the whole conduit which is severely enlar enlarged as you see here. So why is important in this particular case to have a 3D print? Uh, first of all, to understand how you navigate with a catheter. So you have to be able to have a nice roadmap. Whenever you go with a catheter, ideally you have to have a nice roadmap. In the cast lab, we do a lot of angiographies, but they provide only a two-dimensional roadmap in most of the cases. So this is a much better roadmap because you are able to hold um, the heart in in your hands and to rotate, to flip it and try to understand how you get in with a catheter and try to also to understand possible difficulties, especially when you try to get into a very small vessel with a small lumen based on some narrowings after a previous intervention. So this is one of the major advantages of having such models, nice roadmap and even try to simulate before you do the procedure how your catheter is going to get inside and how you are going to place the second stand and so on and so on. What we don't really see in this particular case is a right pulmonary artery which lies a little bit more behind, um, which was also a little bit smallish to cause some additional problems in terms of, in terms of um, catheter navigation in this patient. A very long procedure which eventually resulted in a less optimal um, interventional outcome. So not very happy with this case, not very pleased, but once again, should I have had, should we have had this model before the procedure, I think we could have done it better. So uh, very important takeaway, uh, try, to, try to understand the anatomy, try to have the roadmap and try to figure out how your catheter is going to navigate through these vessels which are not normal, uh, earlier constructed by surgeons in order to achieve in the best way, even in terms of patient safe, safety, your outcome you want to achieve. Um, now, the reason I, I, I said the result is not optimal, once again you see the stent is displaced, also there is some, some part of, some part of um, of the second stand lying just above the first stand. Eventually this second stand dislodged further down into the conduit and the surgeons had to replace the whole conduit which was dilated and also cut into this stand, remove this stand and uh, replace everything with uh, much more softish material. So nice roadmap understand anatomy and also this is very very important uh, in all these patients and this is something we don't have in this model but Einar can fix it and Henrik very easily try to understand the relationship between these vessels and the, uh, the airways so remember especially in smaller patients um, um, the airways may run very very close to all these reconstructed uh, surgically reconstructed pulmonary vessels. So whenever you implant, you implant the stent, you want to make sure 
the stent is not going to uh, compress um, one of the airways, for instance, the left bronchus, which is more typically an issue, a problem in these cases. Um, and I think Einar and Henry could, could easily add the uh, uh, bronchial system and you could once again flip the model and try to understand, especially if you have a softish material, uh, if you have a softish silicon, especially if you have a transparent silicon, try to understand, try to predict in some cases how this stent or how the vessel is going to behave once you put a stent, how the vessel is going to move backward or more anteriorly with a stent and how this, cause, how this could cause an issue with a bronchial system with the airways. So this is another major application or utility of having uh, a 3D print. You can, you can play before you do something in a patient. You can play with different procedures, put a stand, open it, and see how the vessel behaves. I think this is extremely important. And of course, there are other ways to simulate uh, such procedures, much more sophisticated, but I think this could be, this should be available in any cast lab. I'm not a surgeon, but I know that surgeons also have a great use of holding a 3D model um, in the field of congenital cardiology. Now, I'm going to stop here. I have one question to you, Pietro, uh, while we wait for, for other questions. So, um, the, the models, uh, do you want them sterile to, to bring into the cath lab? Um, or is it good enough to practice before? Um, um, that's, a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, ideally, once again, planning must be made well in advance. Um, uh, the mindset of an interventionalist, and I think it's even more important for a cardiac surgeon, is that you are well prepared for a very complex procedure well in advance. So, of course, you might take the model in the CAS lab, but I don't think it's important to have it in the CAS lab. Uh, definitely, it might be more important to have it in the CAS lab once your angiography or imaging in the CAS lab probably is not going, in some cases, it's not going to fit with a 3D print, then you might want to have it. But it doesn't have to be sterile because you can easily uh, go outside the CAS lab and sit down in the control room and discuss and look at the CT, look at the 3D print models again. So the answer is definitely not. And once again, important to emphasize a very simple principle that good planning well in advance is one of the major keys for a successful procedure. So here's a question from Hanna. Uh, a print model is fixed. In the latter example, we saw the right pulmonary artery was not uh, very visible. Have you tried virtual models? And if so, what's the impression? Yeah, uh, that's also a very good comment, a very good question. Um, I do like, I do prefer to have the virtual model because then I can, I can flip myself the model uh, in the way I want. Uh, I can also figure out which cut is more optimal and which one should be avoided. Of course, from my interventional perspective, um, so definitely the virtual model is very, very important and I think it should be included in the package uh, yeah. you offer. I, I, I agree and uh, as a comment to that also what we are experimenting with is to be able to, before we print, to, uh, to send the, the a full model where, where, where you can cut yourself uh, and then have that as a basis for a discussion on where to cut, uh, I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. And um, while, while you do the segmentation, you get the other one for free, basically. So, so it's, um, I mean, the hard work is get the, the full 3D, and then we just cut it and then print it. So it's... Uh, so you buy one, you get the second one for free. <laughs> a bit like that. And, and, and also that uh, it depends also, I think, to me, on the amount of training. Uh, for me, I sometimes really need to hold the models in my hand to understand it. But I don't have the the decades of training that you have, Peter. So for understanding the the anatomy, so 
that's also another thing that um, may come into play, I think. Um, yes, by sure. Um, um, what I want to what I want to emphasize again, um, because I think the focus should be should be placed on the whole image. Um, the three D print is important. Um, the physiology, the function is important as well. And as long as you don't have a lot of metal, I think doing an MRI scan and combining the MRI scan, for instance, to understand the physiology, the function. A differential pulmonary flow is an important complement to um, the anatomical image provided by a 3D model, a 3D print. But once again, this is part of the larger picture which uh, all of us working in the field of congenital cardiology or cardiology mm -hmm. uh, should have at our hands. Um, but I really like to have the model in my hand, to hold it in my hand, to flip it, to rotate it, and try to understand how can, how can I get in, and how, how the anatomy looks like uh, based on what I see, and how can I get inside with my catheter, and how the uh, uh, airways, the bronchial system uh, uh, might be affected in case I would do something which is not going to be good for the patient. So definitely important lessons. Thank you. Um, and, and I think the airways is, is a good point because um, we have not added those so far in almost any model, but it's something that we will, we will I think we'll add and really learn more about that and see how we can construct it in a good way. Uh, actually, you have it. Um, can I, if I can mm -hmm. just, if you go to your first case. All the patient, you have it, but it's not visible. That's the very first case I showed. Um, the older patient with pulmonary atresia VSD amapcas with a severely calcified conduit. In that particular case, um, there was part of the bronchial system included in the in the 3D print I received from Einar and Henrik. Yeah, I think it's difficult, but this is a case I I I. I took as example of how important it is to have the airways because this patient had a very severe narrowing of the left lower lobe uh, vessel artery and um, that vessel was running quite close to part of the left bronchial system and of course one of the major questions I had we had before we performed the stenting of the left lower lobe PA was um, regarding the risk of uh, bronchial compression. So once again, you probably don't see it here, but I can't see it here in this model. It was a different cut. This cut was mainly yeah. done to show us. I think uh, we did two different cuts on this model. Yeah, this cut, yeah, exactly. So this cut was mainly done to show the possibility of implanting a valve just above the stenosis. You see, once again, the calcified conduit, more distally in that conduit which is not possible because we don't have sufficient landing area. But in a different cut, we had the airways and was, I mean, it provided some additional support, mental support to all of us before we did this procedure. To implant the stent in the LPA, in the left lower PA. Uh, um, the model are specific for each patient. What happens to them after you use them? I guess you're interested in very personal purposes, but do you take you take some space to store. I'm uh, just curious, how do you store them? Um, so far, I mean, this is a, a good example. So one of the cases here on the slides, um, I didn't have a, I forgot to take a photo before. So uh, the, that case are on so, some surgeon's um, shelf, I guess. Um, so eventually these shelves will be full, and uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, um, what we said that, we will store them for 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 keeping uh, as long as we think they are interesting and uh, we can show them for, for inspiration and purposes. But we all, always have the digital file, so if we really need them again, we will print them again. So that's we don't need, we will not store them for that purpose. Okay. Maybe a comment. Yeah, I mean definitely it's important from educational point of view. It's important, especially for younger colleagues 
to understand what we do and why we, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in some instances, uh, choose not to perform a certain intervention, uh, being afraid of some close proximity to the airways or of some additional reason. But um, that's, I have another possible um, application of these 3D print models once we don't need them. Um, I've been recently asked by parents of one of the uh, one of the kids I had in the cast lab um, if was if there was any, any chance for them to receive one of these 3D print models. And I think it's important for parents to be fully motivated to understand what we do and how we um, do certain things, complex things, and why they have to come back and back and back and back. It's important to have patients who are um, uh, on our side um, during all these procedures, once again, very complex cases. So um, without asking for permission from Maynard, but uh, fully aware that this will provide a certain aid to the parents, I decided to um, give one of the models because I have two, one of the models to the parents. And they are very, very happy and they actually told me, now Petsu, we understand why you've been doing all these procedures during all this time because we see all these stands and so on and so on. So good to, it's a good example. I mean, these patients are followed from the basically they're born to the adulthood, lots of things. So, so, and this is the good thing if, if you're printing in PLA, uh, the cost for printing is not, not much. And you already do the, 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 um, um, the segmentation anyway. So, so uh, print an extra one, I think it's, it's important. Uh, should not be ne neglected for, for, patient, for, for the parents. And pro probably we should, we should be able to have, um, to obtain from Henrik and Einar, a more simple 3D print model for parents or patients, isn't it? Without so much details, important for us, but not important for patients. So they should probably have a simple heart model with a conduit with some Primary branches earlier stented, and that's it. Nothing yeah. else. Yeah, and um, um, usually there's always some spare capacity. Sometimes in a week or a weekend, and you, you might as well uh, start to print uh, w w before going home, and then have it on, on Monday. So it's not you can use extra capacity on your printers to print those because the models for the parents are less time critical. Um, you can just take them in any time. Mm -hmm. Steve, any more questions right now? Time is slowly running up otherwise. Uh, I have a question, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's possible, for instance, to have the airways mm -hmm. um, colored differently. Yeah. Let's say uh, red, airways should be in red and only vessels in blue or conversely it doesn't matter uh, what do you think uh, yes so, so um color is important color is important yes and um w uh, right now we are a bit limited to two colors uh, with the printers we have um but it's on um uh, there are dark printers that are multicolor printers and for segmentation wise it's not that's not the, the hard part, so it, it's getting them printed. And um, we're also experimenting with uh, printing in, it's no problem to print in different colors, it's having different color at the same model. So um, 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 what, what, we, what we'll do is um, sometimes to print several parts and then we glue them together to get them. So that's um, one, of the, one of the things. Okay, I, I just want to make a very important addition. I, I, I just realized, uh, apologies for this, in a very busy week, I, I re-baptized uh, Eric. <laughs> I called him Henrik all the time. So whenever I said Henrik, I meant Eric. Just no, to make you aware of this. Um, I think what is also important when you have a 3D printing congenital cardiology, uh, crucial for surgeons, is to let them or let us interventionalists and surgeons decide how to cut mm. this model. So in some instances, use the seizure mm. and do the cut ourselves. Uh, have a transfer of silicone once again mm. 
sufficiently softish, uh, not so much rub inside um, in order to crush the model if you try to do something like this. Yeah, and um, uh, and also I think this really stresses the importance. Why should we have it on the host in the hospital? Because then the surgeons can just easily come down or we come up to 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 to, um, to them and discuss and how do you want it? Uh, that's really really important. I think that's a, a key thing. Yeah. Okay, with that, uh, it's uh, I think it's one o'clock. So thank you for your interest today. And as usual, I will um, uh, put out the recording and um, also email out uh, an event that will be not next week, but the week after uh, for the Swedish speaking uh, audience. Okay, thanks a lot.